My guest today is Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, a tireless advocate for justice, democracy and human rights in Nigeria and in every respect a champion of the cause of the Nigerian masses. He has served as a member of Nigeria's Truth Commission, Secretary of the Political Reform Conference for Nigeria and as a member of Nigeria's Electoral Reform Committee, to mention a few. And in his protests against corruption and injustice, in his criticism of government's failures and in his defence of the downtrodden, he's faced off against powerful figures. But always he's remained consistent and both his critics and his supporters agree that he is unquestionably a man with a strong social conscience. I'll be joined in the studio by Bishop Matthew Kuka, a remarkable Nigerian. I'm Charles Anyagulu, and this is The Arise Interview. Now, my guest today is one of Nigeria's most prominent and fearless advocates for justice, democracy, and human development. For more than three decades, Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka has been drawing national and international attention to the darkest corners of Nigerian society, protesting against corruption and injustice, and defending those he says are oppressed and mistreated. It's often pitted him against those in power who he says do little to deliver civil rights and social justice in Nigeria against a backdrop of rising poverty, unemployment and growing insecurity. Recently, he's faced attacks from the Nigerian presidency over statements he made to the U.S. Congress about the state of affairs in Nigeria. Here's a snippet of him speaking virtually in July to lawmakers in Washington. Just what is significant about the situation in Nigeria is that we are in a democracy, yeah, albeit a very weak, you know, with, with all the weak structures, with all the inefficiency, with all the deficiencies. It's not as if we are struggling uh, to overthrow a dictatorship or that we have a situation in which some autocrat is in power and we need to get him out of the way so that we can establish a democracy. It is that these things are happening in a democracy. And I think what is also significant and worthy of note is that things have just got have just unraveled you know in the last five or six years since the coming to power of general buhari um he didn't make boko haram happen you know but uh, the, the 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 fact that today the northwest uh, and north central and literally every the length and breadth of nigeria has now been invaded by bandits and headsmen and killers and all kinds of people who have come from god knows where um, and the fact that the government just seems to be either helpless or almost un, un, uninterested in dealing decisively, you know, with these people. This is what has added more confusion to the mix. Uh, and the contradiction here is that the president has blatantly pursued rather nepotistic, but also policies that show very clearly preferences for men and women of his faith. Uh, the entire security outfit now is in the hands of Muslims. The, the president of, I mean, the chief justice of Nigeria, who was a Christian, was replaced under very dubious circumstances. Uh, in the National Assembly, it was always the case that if you had a Christian as Senate president, you would have a, a, you know, a Muslim as a speaker or whatever the case. But for the first time in the history of our country, literally every outlet is, is you know, is, is more or less being blocked because the Senate president is a, is a Muslim, the Speaker of the House is a Muslim, the Deputy Speaker is a Muslim, the Majority Leader is a Muslim, and these are all fine gentlemen, but that's not the point. The point is that the level of anxiety among us as Christians and Muslims has exacerbated. And uh, Bishop Matthew Kuka, who you heard speaking there, joins me now in the studio. Absolutely delighted to see you. Uh, Bishop Kuka, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you, Jeff. And just summarize for us what you said to the U.S. Congress about Nigeria, which was construed as very critical of the Buhari government and had their backs up as a result. I don't, first of all, I think in fairness to the president, uh, he has expressed no objection to anything I said. Um, and I'm sure that every Nigerian knows that on a good day, Garbashehu, Femi Adeshino, Loretta, uh, on a wild goose, goose chase, purely and simply on their own. Um, and even the fate of Loretta uh, before the National Assembly suggests very clearly 
that we are family addition or, or, or Garba Shehu in their exuberance to appear before the National Assembly for validation, they will be thrown out of, of, of town. And these are all spokespeople Absolutely. for the president. But they, they have said themselves, obviously, they're not speaking for the president. They're speaking for the presidency. The presidency doesn't exist, <laughs> you know, in any shape or form. Mm. Um, so, and you can see from the things they say that um, these are people that obviously don't seem to have anything to do. And I don't blame them for that. But you can see metaphorically what they say is that there is a huge gap between them and the person they claim to represent. And I think that's why they very safely and cleverly opted to speak for the presidency, not the president, with whom they have no contact. If you may indulge me, let me just give you two or three good examples. I've been on the corridors, let me put it that way, for a pretty long time. And I think I know a, a real presidential spokesman when I see one. And I'll give you just three examples. Um, about 1992 or there, about 93, I called uh, Duro Nabule. Who that was, was the spokesman for Duro. President Babangida at the time. Fantastic gentleman, fantastic journalist. And I said to him one day, and I said, look, if you want to see the president, how do you go about it? And he laughed. And he said, you want to see the president? And I said, yes. And I said, you know, what about? And I said, you know, it was after the... the, 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 the condemnation of Zamani Lekwot and we've been trying to, the, the Archbishop of Kaduna, the right. Bishop of Mina had been trying to see the president and he wasn't successful. And long story short, uh, Duro Nabule said, look, President Babangida has always been, he's very fond of you and he, he likes the things you say, so seeing he will not be a problem. I won't take you through the long story, but he made it happen. Um, there was a, something that happened under Yaradua and my friend Shekun Adeni was presidential spokesman. And I called Femi and I said, look, I've got a problem. There's something I need to say that must get to the ears of the president. And he said, send it to me. And I sent it to him. In less than one hour, Femi calls me. I say, she she then he calls right. me and says, look, what you sent to me is right now in front of the president. Next, uh, my friend Ruben Abati, your colleague. Um, it, again, it's a long story, and this is part of the of, of the 9, 2015 presidential elections. We were on a very, very tough period when between President Jonathan and President, and, well, General Buhari then, who had just won the elections, we were trying to negotiate a meeting, and there was just one more day left to the elections. We drafted the chairman of the peace committee, we drafted a, a statement which was supposed to be read and signed by both <laughs> President Jonathan and General Buhari. Unfortunately, General Buhari had gone to Fortinibu's birthday cer ceremony and so on. We had barely an hour. And I called Ruben Abati. I said, Ruben, where are you? Because I'm trying to reach President Jonathan and I have to talk to him. And Ruben says to me, I'm somewhere, I'm not far from the villa. And I said, listen, I'm going to send something to you on your, and I borrowed, I think, somebody's iPad. I said, I'm going to send something to you. Please take it to the president. Place it before him and tell him to please read it. Now, Ruben Abati comes back to me and says, the president has read it and he has accepted. In my view, I'm talking to a presidential spokesman who knows the president. Right now, what we have is a contraption. I've never, you know, we have a media and publicity man. We have a presidential spokesman. You know the story better than myself. A presidential spokesman is supposed to be an amplifier of the thinking, you know, the policy processes. And every day or every week, he should address a room full of journalists, explaining to them what government policy is and clarifying issues and taking questions. And may I ask you, when last did you ever see Garba Shehu or, she or, or Femi Adeshido sit down and address the Nigerian media over a government policy? Well, so, let me ask you this then, because obviously those comments you made to the U.S. Congress elicited a withering response from the, the presidency. Their statement accused you of castigating your country in front of a foreign parliament and that you were doing your best to sow discord and strife among Nigerians and and of course that this uh, you know accused you of, of, of making falsehoods I expect that you've had a chance to look at the full statement by Garba Shehu which has been published and is there for all to see I've read the statement mm. I'm for the records Charles and I need you to help me tell Garba Shehu Lai Mohammed 
additional and everybody who speaks for this president to find a date to find a venue and to let me know i'm more than happy to sit down with all of them on any good day mm. the point is that as you know if you read what i said and after i finish first of all <laughs> if you've been to any of these events they ask us in advance to write not more than five pages mm. i wrote three and a half pages and as i said very clearly I have a letter of invitation by the organizers of the conference. And these guys have no idea what the issues are. If you read my statement, after I finish my, we were asked to, no matter what it was you wrote, it shouldn't be more than five pages, but you have only five minutes to make your presentation. The document is before them. Now, I think that these guys rushed to make a statement without reading the text of what I said. Mm. And good journalism suggests so very clearly, if you are really seriously, a presidential spokesman taking on such a responsibility, you should have the decency to say, please, where is the text of this thing that Bishop, that Bishop Kuka said? Secondly, a conference of that magnitude is taking place in Washington. Even if you heard that Bishop Kuka is going to speak and you suspect my intention, you got foot soldiers in Washington. Tell them to go and listen to Bishop Kuka and hear what he has to say. These guys went out on a wild goose chase. I am sure that if they have a conscience, when they read my text, they are the ones who should apologize to me. Because there's nothing that Garba Shehu said that suggested he either understood or had read mm. what I said. If Nevertheless, you what you said, what you said, though, is, is on YouTube. I mean, it, it was plus, a virtual plus conference. Plus, so, so anybody please, can watch it and what, see it. Please, I don't even have to apologize. Let them tell mm. me one single thing that I said that I have not said a thousand times. Well, I have to be honest with you. I, am in, I, I tend to agree with you because I've watched your, the, the, you know, the testi your testimony in front of Congress, and I don't really see anything that's unusual that you have not said you in know the past. So, said to, you know what somebody I'm said I'm not to entirely me. sure I you know understand. What I mean, said. I'm not taking sides, no, no, but, you know, but I'm just but let making me tell you a what, point. Let me tell you what a friend of mine said. And he, say, he calls me up and he says, okay, Bishop Kuka, the problem with you is whatever you say, you just throw red meat <laughs> at these people. So and I cannot understand for the life of me that are these guys just sitting down and waiting for Bishop Kuka to speak? And guess what? It makes me very happy. I believe in freedom of speech, but freedom of speech is not to speak irresponsibly. Mm. And I don't think that even any of my enemies can accuse me of having abused anybody or said something that is personal. And are these guys denying that people are dying? Are they accusing me of being divisive? What do you mean by being divisive? I have said from time immemorial that the policies, uh, you don't have to agree with me. I am, when I'm convinced of something, I speak about it. Not because I'm right, but that's my conviction. If new facts come, I'm happy to receive them. On these issues, I have said from day one, I disagree with the president. The nature and pattern of his managing diversity has left us divided. So to suggest by any stretch of the imagination that I, Matthew Cook, am responsible for sending out divisive, in what sense? I think part of the, the, the problem is basically that you, you're a, a very popular, well-known figure. So everything you say gets a lot of attention across Nigeria and beyond. And therefore, it, it, it almost makes it imperative that they feel they have to respond they, to it. They Please stay with us. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Right. We'll come straight back. You're watching The Arrival interview plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with Bishop Matthew Kuka Catholic Bishop of Sokoto in Northwest Nigeria and one of this country's most influential clerics stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, my guest today is Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, Catholic Bishop of Sokoto at the extreme end of Northwest Nigeria and one of the sharpest intellects in this country. He's combined a strong sense of morality and spirituality with civil and human rights activism. And not surprisingly, it's put him in the national spotlight, earning him both admiration and derision at home, as well as international recognition abroad. And more recently, the ire of the Buhari administration, especially for his virtual address to the U.S. Congress in July about the state of affairs in Nigeria. It's like we all keep saying, 
It's not as if Christians, I mean, Muslims are having a better life because they've got all the social services and the rest of us don't have them. It is that we are faced with governments that are underperforming, governments that have adopted corruption, inefficiency, and that the reaction that we are facing is largely a reaction of, uh, is the result of a, a state that is unable to deliver on it on the way on its welfare. So going forward, I make the point that this president has made even interreligious dialogue very difficult, in part because of the illusion that has been created that Muslims are in power. The reality of the situation is that, in my view, 80, 90 percent of ordinary Muslims in Nigeria just want to live a decent life. And they're not concerned about who is doing what. So in the final analysis, really, it's a question of governments and President Buhari coming to terms with the fact that the country is falling apart. People are divided. We've never been as divided as we are now. People are dying by the day. The government doesn't seem to be doing anything to rehabilitate them and so And Bishop Matthew Kuka is still with me in the studio. Thank you very much indeed uh, for staying with us. I, I noticed that in your clip, one of the clips that, that I watched, um, that, that we played of you testifying to the U.S. Congress, your focus was on what appears to be the religious divide. But a lot of people see the current divisions in Nigeria as more ethnic or tribal than religious. Is that something you agree or disagree with? No, let me even explain to you, Charles. Mm. First, and this is the beginning of the misunderstanding. The, what I went for, the testimony at the U.S. Congress was on religious pe persecution mm. around the world. It was a first leg of a much bigger conference, which lasted for three good days in Washington, D.C. I was invited to speak specifically to the issues of the persecution of Christians. Others were invited to speak about the persecution of Muslims, yes. of Baha'is, of different groups yes. altogether. Even in China and so Even, on, I so saw that. When a military friend of mine said, why did you not speak about the whole of Nigeria? I said, sir, you are a general in the Nigerian army. Should the president call for a meeting of service chiefs to assess their performances? Would you, as chief of army, go and speak about the navy? I wasn't invited to speak about religious persecution across Nigeria. Mm. I was invited to speak about what Christians were experiencing. Now, so that thematically, that's what the issue. And if you look at my statement, paragraph 15, I made the point very clear. And I tried as much as possible to navigate a very delicate footwork by making the point that, look, in all of this, first of all, I don't like the word religion and Christians in Nigeria about Christians. I don't like it. It is imprecise, but it also doesn't speak to the issue of our common citizenship. It's only in this country people don't like die as Nigerian. They just tell you Muslims have died, Christians have died. I don't like it because it speaks to the failure of the Nigerian state to unite us under a common platform. So if you listen very carefully mm. to the text, and unfortunately I've not listened. I had to speak off the cuff because I, wasn't, I couldn't read the text. Mm. So i don't know exactly everything i said but there's there's hardly anything i said that i either regret or would take back so if you take the conversation outside the context of what i will be i i, I was asked to speak on in washington i may have a beautiful voice but it is of no use if i'm singing outside the choir no absolutely so that's so <laughs> but, that's but let, let's let's then talk about that question of religion and this seemingly endless conflict between christians and Muslims. Is there really a conflict in this country? I mean, why does religion appear to be such a disruptive force in Nigeria? And this is something you and I talked about a little bit on the phone before you came here. You know, Charles, this is a, perhaps I'm the first Nigerian to have written a PhD thesis on religion and politics. It's a Molotov cocktail, even on a good day. It's a topic nobody wants to talk about. Mm. It is inherently conflictual. Now, when you bring it to a situation in Nigeria, and look, I spent over 10 years as a consultant, you know, to the Vatican on interreligious dialogue. What you're dealing with here is it's not a problem between Christians and Muslims. The first thing I say to people openly, listen, these guys, if you talk about the Muslims who are privileged or Christians who are privileged in any government, it's a tiny circle of less than a thousand people. They stole from the last administration, they will steal from this administration and steal from the next administration. And they're just exchanging 
when they are on their plane going to Dubai, they, they're not talking about Christians, about Islam and Christianity. They know that very well. The rest of us know that. Ordinary people have no idea. So they create the impression, and I've said to my Muslim friends, part of the difficulty, let's return to the scene of the crime. We know what happened. In 1999, when Obasanjo was, was, you know, was elected, we know what happened in Zamfara. The core northern states, 12 core northern states, all declared, proclaimed, adopted Sharia. Mm. Nobody came from anywhere to, to fight Sharia away from northern Nigeria. But the, my brother Muslims in northern Nigeria must also now explain how and why the areas of intense violence are now coterminous with those areas where Sharia law was declared. Was declared. It is because the Sharia that was declared was a political form of Sharia, not the religious. Mm. So what has happened to us in Nigeria is that the issues that are contentious have never been debated. You see, the South Africans, before apartheid ended, Mandela came out of prison, I think 11th of February, 1990. But he did not become president until May, I think May 18 or 1995. 19, uh, but don't forget, amidst all this, all kinds of things happened. But the South Africans had five good years, five years, to debate the issue of what kind of society they wanted to create. Nigeria has never had that kind of debate. Yes, so, so basically, that, that's a very interesting point. You're saying that the space for debate has been constrained there is the or constraint. weighed down by politics. There basically. is that, but there right. is also the quality of people right. involved in this debate. And I don't mean disrespect. I was secretary of the political reform conference. Mm. That was the closest I came to watching all this. When you look at it against the backdrop of what happened, roll the tape and go back to the United States of America, for example, the, the famous Continental Congress of 1787, mm. you know, in which some of the key actors, some people like James Madison and Thomas uh, Jefferson, who became third, uh, fourth president and third president, respectively. Now, it's very interesting that when there was talk about this, about this uh, conference to debate the future of America, the, you know, the story is that James Madison was in Virginia, mm. but his friend Thomas Jefferson was living in, you know, in France. And he calls, he writes a letter to him and says, please, we're going to have this debate. Can you get me books about democracy? And he comes back with about 195 books for his friend. The intensity of that debate, and when you go back and look at the issue, that is what kind of society do we want? Now that we ended, we fled feudalism in England, we've conquered colonialism by the British, what kind of society do we want? And you can see how much they borrow from John Locke on the whole question of liberty, freedom. It is there in the 1776 declaration. We are committed to a proposition that all men and all women are created equal. We've got a minute before we have to take a break, but keep talking. So the point, therefore, is that we've never had a situation in which Nigerians have made up their mind about what kind of society they are proposed, you know, to you know to have. So we're now having a society of ethnic, religious, and other forms of alliances and allegiance. The critical question that this country has not resolved is who are we as Nigerians? We are Igbos, we are Yorubas, we are Christians, we are Muslims. And this is why the country has become a pressure cooker. And the violence and tension will continue because we have no clear understanding of who we are. We don't have a set of rights that we can say we are appropriate because we are Nigerians. So for me, these are the issues. The, the amount of intellectual depth that is required to sort out this whole thing is not there. It's not there. Or at least haven't been given a chance to express and we, and, itself. Well, because you see... Okay. When, whenever we've had co what they call constitutional from 1976 right through till the last constitutional conference if you go back and i've checked the records you Very will quickly. find that politicians just the governors choose their friends right okay. and they come to abuja and plan for when the next elections will be we'll come straight back to you you're watching the arise interview plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with bishop matthew kuka catholic bishop of sokoto in northwest nigeria and one of this country's most influential clerics stereos
Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anya Gulu. Now my guest today is the outspoken and fearless Nigerian social and civil rights activist Bishop Matthew Kuka who for decades has been at the forefront of fighting for justice in this country. In addition to being a champion of good governance and defender of the downtrodden, his sharp intellect and wit have brought him recognition nationally and internationally. He has a Bachelor of Divinity degree from the Pontifical Urban University in Rome, a Master's degree in Peace Studies from the University of Bradford in the UK, and a PhD from the University of London. He also attended the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, Oxford University in England, and Harvard University in the US. In addition, he's written several books, and apart from his books, there are literally thousands of works to his name, including articles, presentations, papers in academic journals and numerous other research submissions. And his byline can be traced to virtually every newspaper in Nigeria from 1980 to the present. And the irrepressible Bishop Matthew Kuka is still with me in the studio. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. Um, I know you've talked about other things, but can it be said now that there is something of a standoff between you and Asorok at the moment? I don't know why you keep going back to... Look, look, <laughs> let me, can I give you an example? Frankly, I'm convinced I don't have a problem with the president. Right. I think he knows that. He has my respect. But you mentioned the presidency. Yeah, though. Well, because these characters are not the president. And mm. they've never said they are speaking for the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So I've downgraded everything they have to say because it has no authenticity. It has no, you know, source. Um, and like I said, I know a, a spokesman of the president when I see one. What these people are, they are not the president, the pre president's spokesman. And as I said, they are honest enough to admit. But let me come back to the point. I'm a priest. I'm a citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And I have said it many times. I feel many, very honored. It's not something I can say I'm proud of. From the time I met President Shagari in 1980, in State House, Ribadu Road, until today, there is no Nigerian president I've not sat down with face to face. Not because I feel the foreman has to see them, except General Abacha. But that's a different story. So this, I don't speak out of animosity. Guess what? Garpa Shehu, where was he? He was working for, <laughs> for, for, for Atiku. Atiku contested election against Buhari, so he knows where he was. Lai Mohammed, and I said to them, one by one, I know where we were. I knew how, how much they held me in high esteem during the struggle against dictatorship. All right? And I said to my friends, you have changed lanes. I'm still in my lane. Um, and that people should come back now and appropriate General Boa. These guys are defending their bread. They are not defending Nigeria. I, I'm a Nigerian. I'm concerned about this country. They are concerned about President Buhari because that is the source of their legitimacy and relevance. And I, I don't grudge them for that. However, it is our responsibility to remain in constant contestation with the state. Because, again, philosophers like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, some of my favorite philosophers. John, look, Thomas Hobbes said, look, look, listen, should we trust the state? And he said, because he was born during the English war, and he knew what he experienced, he said, listen, what we need to do is to have a state, which he called the Leviathan, mm. and it will have all the powers in exchange for our security and our freedom. John Locke said, no, human beings are fundamentally free and born free. And because he, his thinking was appropriated by the Americans, that is why you see in the declaration, they said, we are committed to the proposition that all men are born Absolutely. equal. So what I'm saying is, President Bu Bu General Buhari knows, and i give you one example. When, I think May 29th, after, you know, with the euphoria and the exuberance of the Redeemer has come, all our sins are going to be taken away. Now, Many people, I say to people, hold on. It's not like that. Let's be clear about where this train is going first. Nothing personal. I also knew the reflexes of General Buhari. But I said, look, all this thing about trying people and so on, we're in a democracy for crying out loud. Mm. 
Now, when people be somebody called me and said, "Look, there are whispers in the villa. The people are not comfortable." And I said, "Who is not comfortable?" They said, well, "You are against the president." I give President Buhari full marks. I put a call through to the villa, and I got one of my his aides, and I said, "Listen, I would like to see the president." I think I can speak about this open. I said, I would like to see the president. But if I want to, if, you are, if it's possible, I want to see him by 11 o'clock tomorrow because I'm leaving for Sokoto and my flight is 12. To my greatest shock, I mean, you don't ask to see the president and, and uh, you know, <laughs> but I took the risk. And the gentleman said to me, I'll get back to you maybe in about two or three hours because the president is very busy. And I said, fine. 40 minutes later, he calls me and says, look, I met the president, I told him we want to see him, and he also says his program is very, I told him his diary is very tight, but he said, the president said to me, you must find a space for, for Bishop Kuka. He says, come at 11. I came at, I said, no, I'll be there at 10, just in case there is a window. I arrived at the villa at 10. I'm in the, in the waiting room at 10.30. About five minutes later, somebody comes and says, the president will now see you. The pictures are there on, 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 on television. And when I sat with the president, first thing I said to him, I said, sir, congratulations. And I said it to him, I said, I didn't expect you to win this election, but congratulations. He said, and then I said something to him very frankly. I said, sir, I hear that you are not happy. There are things I have said you are not happy. Can you please let me know? Because I need us to clarify this. And I said it to him frankly, I don't want to distract your government. The president looks at me. And he said something. I was touched. He said to me, said, Bishop Kuka, on any topic, I can tell where you stand. I'm saying so, not because he may not be angry or unhappy with me, but mm. I think that I'm within reach. And if the president were to, were to feel about me what these characters are claiming he's feeling, there are things he can do. And you know, I'm here. Well, so, thank you for sharing that with us. That, that's very important. But, but let me move into the areas that you are noted for speaking about, which is, you know, the problems that afflict Nigeria. Why do you think things are the way they are in this country? Why are we the way we are in this country struggling with so much? You know, I've written extensively about this and I've reflected also about some of these themes. Mm. Look we didn't get to where we are by accident. This is the road we didn't take. And military rule didn't help our situation. Usually when I speak, the soldiers say to me, but the military has been gone for, 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 for over 20 years. How come you guys can't get your act together? And I said, no, Danfodio has been dead for over 200 years. The impact of his jihad is still with us. Okay, the British have been gone for over 50 years. The impact of colonial, things don't just go away mm. like that. Now, if you notice the first generation of politicians, we have some really exceptionally brilliant people. Unfortunately, my argument, and it is not, it's my conviction, I may be wrong, but I think that had the military executed the war and stepped aside and allowed democracy to return in 1971 or 70, as the case may be, because we had some really fantastic mm. politicians, we probably would have ground ourselves and managed to get things sorted out. The military stayed. Mm. The oil money began to flow. And we just we lost, you know, the roadmap. Yes. Today we are stumbling and fumbling. And we've never had the patience to ask ourselves how are societies organized? What really is democracy? Because we are conflicting all mm. kinds of things. Here we are, we are claiming to be in a democracy. We are looking for a role for traditional rulers, which is a return to feudalism. We are looking for a role for, you know, the, it's, a, it's a system that is only powered by moneyed people, which mm. is a plutocracy, okay? Uh, it is a system in which people believe that religion should play the most dominant role, which is a theocracy. So the fine principles of democracy require an egalitarian environment in which everybody should be able to feel free to express themselves. So the point is that we haven't given this a lot of thinking. Mm. And the politicians, the military didn't help matters because we also had almost a teleguided uh, you know, transition. So, technically speaking, we're not like South Africa. We never had a transition in Nigeria. We just had what Fela would say, an army arrangement. And I'm sure you know very well that by the time that we, the, the Abacha died, I think we were pretty clear about who was going to be, you know, who was going to be president. The founding, the, who was going to be president was already a decision taken. The founding of the PDP as a, as, a, as a platform for wheeling that person to power was already taken. So that's why you find that we cannot conduct what you call elections. 
okay we do not have political parties ask yourself in the last 20 years or so of this democracy how many parties people have crossed from the president right down people have been here been there been mm -hmm. here been here so what you call political parties really don't qualify for that name you know they're just friendly associations convey your vehicles to carry our ambitions to the place where you know the the stealing takes place and so so for me we still have a lot of work to do in terms of even understanding the principles of democracy right. but in terms of the because i mean you you you've always been seen uh, as a very somebody who's driven by morality and and a, and a profound sense of justice do, do you think nigeria is an unjust society nigeria is a terribly unjust society it is an unjust society it's not just to itself it's not fair to its citizens in various categories um it doesn't even have the architecture to make justice happen uh, let me tell you something that your father's friend uh, said to me justice oputa you know he used to tell me quite a lot of jokes when we walked together he said you know there was this guy who was walking on the streets of london and he says um please uh, gentleman i'm trying to find the high court of justice you know where, where where is it and he says the cleaner says to him you know just keep walking keep walking you find the high courts whether they deliver justice i don't know <laughs> the, 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 high court. I like so that. the point is that you know the struggle for justice is a contest all right but as it is even in even at that realm it's been elevated to a point in which you don't have the resources mm. you can't participate in that contest uh, and you know again that is the whole question that we needed to have thought about how do you create a house in which people with diverse backgrounds can come and find a place to settle and this is why we are trying to deal with questions we should have dealt with a long time ago. right but, but given that th those questions have not been dealt with uh, we've got about two minutes before we take a break how can that injustice be overcome well, and can the courage of people like you help to overcome well that is why people like like my enemies let me put it that way who are trying to close the door are a greater threat to democracy because the kuka center organized um, you know a fantastic conversation last week on the close the implications of the closing of the civ of, of the civic space and you needed to have heard the voice of young mm. people it is that you know when people begin to fear democracy and its consequences then you know <clears throat> they have no reflexes for democracy so for me this is an intellectual exercise and i keep saying to people you know when nigeria said they want a good man to govern them or a good woman to govern them you don't need a good man to govern you that's that's not what you need you need a good man to be chairman of the parish council or whatever but the president of nigeria it is it, for me fixing the potholes giving us electricity is not a moral decision let me put it that way you don't need to be a priest to do that being morally conscious helps and this is why you have this superfluous expression of religiosity in nigeria and getting very little results people are praying so that they can steal successfully <laughs> uh, people are praying so that the proceeds of theft can come to them uh, so you have a totally chaotic society survival of the fittest um, and really where we are today in nigeria is evidence of period of gestation of all the terrible things that we have swallowed or left unattended to because you ask yourself we are saying the bandits didn't go to school how does it then happen that the guys who have come out literally of with a cave mentality are the ones who are now holding the entire country mm. to ransom that's a good question and on that note we're going to take a break but we're going to come back and talk about that some more you're watching the arise interview plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with bishop matthew kuka catholic bishop of sokoto in northwest nigeria stay with us Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Inyagolu. Now let's continue our chat with my guest today, Bishop Matthew Kuka, the man who's been described as the unacknowledged liberation spokesman of the masses. Over many years, he's focused attention on the deep simmering societal crisis that he sees as being responsible for the deadly escalation of poverty, unemployment, and violence in Nigeria. To paraphrase him, Nigeria is like a boiling volcano Volcano waiting to erupt. Over those years, he's created his own form of militancy and spirituality in the service of social and political justice in Nigeria. 
his academic achievements and his prolific authorship of many books have made him famous and brought both national and international recognition. But through it all, Bishop Matthew Cooker has anchored and sustained his life and work on a spiritual base. He is, after all, a priest at heart and by profession, the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto at the extreme end of northwest Nigeria. And Bishop Matthew Kuka is still with me in the studio. Thank you for staying with us. And just before we went on a break, you had started talking about banditry. So let me ask you, what's the spark that's triggered the banditry in the north? And, because we can't forget this, the separatist agitation in the south. You know, um, that, and that's what I said, that we need something that is not popular in Nigeria. That is a sense of diagnosis. Mm. Um, and I consider myself a public intellectual. Um, and I have the pieces of paper to show. And I think that I am pretty well placed, uh, and I have a moral duty and a responsibility to say the things I say and to do the things I do. Not because they are popular, but somebody else is paying to keep me fed and clothed. And those are some of the poor people I see on my pew every day. Without them, I will not be where I am. So, and, you know, people say to me, ah, but you know, you should go and see the president and tell him the problems. I remember during, during, during uh, President Obasanjo, I had unfettered access. And that was largely because of the work I was doing with the Ogoni people. Mm. And one day I, I get to the villa and I'm having a cup of coffee, waiting to see the president. And uh, President Obasanjo comes in and he says to me, he said, why are you... You are waiting to see me. I have not even come and you are drinking coffee. <laughs> and I said to him, I, I said, sir, this is not your house. It's the house for the president of Nigeria. <laughs> and you know, I, you know, Basanjo, he, he can take anything. Mm. So I said to him, jokingly, I said, oh, God, they brought you from prison to be president. Oh, me, I never go to prison before. So I qualified to be in this house too. <laughs> then one gentleman who was sitting by walked up to me. He said, hey, Farakuka, you are always very critical of government. See, you can always enter here and talk to him. I said, okay. I know I can always enter here. When Obasanjo was in prison, I knew I could reach Abacha. Why was I talking? Is it now I was talking when, Abba, when, when he was held in prison, now he's out of prison and things are happening and I cannot say a word because I have access. To, I said, if I have access to a president, I have greater access to and responsibility to those who are outside. And guess what, Charles? I, 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 with all sense of honesty, I am humbled by the attention that I get, which you merited. I want to thank the Nigerian media for placing the microphone before me. It's not because I have the most, you know, the best opinion, you, you know, to, to make, but I speak of my conviction. So, and it is in my interest, and I think it's also right, you know, that we, we maintain this level of volatility, because mm. otherwise, if you let those in power go to sleep, there will be problem. And I, you know, if, if I, I ask my friends, for example, uh, Garba Shehu and uh, Adeshina and Lai Mohammed, after all, they crowned, let them ask all the pastors that were their friends in 2014 and 2015, let them tell me one of them who, whom they can call and he will answer. They are already fighting with all of them. I wasn't one of their prophets. But they are no longer in touch with their prophets because they have discontinued the relationship. So we are in a bad spot. And if anybody you know, deceives you, he's wasting his time. Because I'm a very privileged Nigerian, mm. very privileged. So it's not about the big people. We need to create an environment you know, in which everybody is free to aspire to what they want to be. It's not, there are beggars in America. But the great thing about America is everybody continues to live with that illusion. And that's why the beauty of democracy, most of the benefits of democracy are intangible. You know, so when I see these people running around and talking about, come and see the bridges we are building, come and see the roads we are constructing, guess what? You don't need democracy to do road construction because that's not what democracy was meant to be. Most of the benefits of democracy are intangible. If you wanted infrastructure, then let's go back to apartheid in South Africa. If you wanted infrastructure, let's go back to Germany under Hitler. They left the most indelible infrastructure. But they denied human beings the fundamental mm. thing. That's a, that's a very good so point. So I think it's important that those who govern us know that freedom of speech is a human right. And mm. a, a human right is human. It's not an aspiration. A human right is a right that God has given to you. And nobody can take away. And guess what? When I was in 2011, 
when President uh, Buhari contested the election, or is it 20, 2007, when he lost to Yaradua, 2007, he went to court. And get, remember, it's just that people have a terrible sense, you know, sense of memory in this country. The president went to court. People, northerners, were saying, how can you, your brother from Kasina, has, has won election, and you are a Muslim, and you are a northerner. Why, why are you going to the Supreme Court? I wrote an article, it's there on the internet, encouraging Buhari to go to court so that democracy can be strengthened mm. because this is not about, it's not about friendship. So is, is that what it means to be a voice of conscience in a country like Nigeria for you? I don't know. I don't want to make those lofty claims. Let me tell you, I compete only with myself. I don't, I'm not claiming to be speaking for anybody or everybody. Every, I'm reading a book or, or two books. And when I'm reading a book, I set goals for myself. I say to myself, I want to read the first 50 pages. Mm. That's what I'm give, the goal I give myself. I may end up minimum 50 pages, but I could go 60. So I set my goals for my... I'm competing only with myself. It's for me an accident that people agree with me, and I'm humbled and I appreciate. But please, I'm an intellectual, and the basis of intellectualism is an exchange of ideas. Mm. You know, Plato said debate is an exchange of ignorance. Okay, it is conversation that is an exchange of knowledge. So I worry because we are still not at the tail end of democracy. When people think that the very fact that you are expressing your view in a way that doesn't square with them makes you an enemy of state. I can tell any every Nigerian where I was in 1995. Okay, and during one of our darkest moments. Let all those who are who are making all these allegations tell me where they were. And we've got um, a couple of minutes before we have to end the chat and it's just been absolutely fascinating talking with you but i must make reference to one of your books which deals with the collapse of the moral order in africa and another one of your books which focuses on a just democratic nigeria are these two topics inextricably linked i i, I think as a priest and let me say, as a Christian, you cannot help but be restless about a just society. Jesus said, I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full. I am a guardian of that commitment by virtue of being a Christian, but also more so by being a priest. People say to me, but you are a bishop. You know, you shouldn't be saying, and I say it is precisely because I'm a bishop. That's why I'm saying the things I'm saying. Our, the, 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 the former Archbishop of Abuja, uh, Cardinal Onaeka, once said to me at the launch of the Kuka Center, he, you know, he, he says very serious things, rather unseriously. And he said, he said you know, uh, he was addressing the, the congregation. He said, you know, we used to worry about the things Bishop Kuka was, uh, was always saying, you know, making people nervous and so on. And we were not. <laughs> and then he said, but while we were wondering, all of a sudden, the Pope makes him bishop. It means there must be something meaningful in his noise making. So, but I'm not speaking so that anybody will hear me. I'm speaking because I have an opportunity and I've never claimed that what I'm saying must be accepted by people. But, I like a good debate. Yes, but, but in a sense, because you mentioned Jesus, which is inextricably linked to your Catholic philosophy, for you, it's thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And of course, in Matthew 25, from 31 to the end, that will has to square. If it doesn't square, I can't get to heaven. I'm not going to heaven for the reasons that many of us are very concerned right. about. Okay? That you are not going to be denied. You will you may be denied heaven, but not, not for the reasons that are popular among us. Okay. Okay? But you'll be denied heaven because I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me a drink. I was in prison, you didn't okay. visit me. You didn't Bishop. visit me. Not because I was a Christian, but because I was a human being. Bishop Matthew Kuka, an absolute delight to have you here. Thank you very much indeed. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Bye-bye.